You might be seated in the house of God. Thank you, Elder Wilson, for that tremendous uh, introduction. And uh, thank God for you. He's doing a tremendous job. Praise God. And to all of the saints of the Most High, it's good to see everybody this morning. We've come back from a successful AIM uh, service uh, conference in our national church. And uh, we're going to uh, just jump right into the word of the Lord today. There is a word from the Lord. Uh, and uh, before I go, I know Jesus Pride Month is over, but I, you know, people send me things, and I, I, I just think it's so nice. Um, Global, Globe Shakers was started by a young woman who was saved and delivered from a lesbian lifestyle. And uh, she's made shirts and things, and she's promoting um, uh, this and sent one to the man. Look at this. Isn't that nice? And, and this, is, this is from someone who was caught up. Show them on the screen. Who was caught up. And uh, the Lord set her free. And she got the seven colors. You know, you got to have the seven. And isn't that wonderful? And she sent one uh, to us. And uh, you, listen, there's a movement that's taking place. And I thank God for being a part of it. Isn't the Lord good? He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. So we're just grateful. I want to call your attention this morning to the word of the Lord. I pray that everyone have their, have, have their Bibles. We're going to the book of Ruth. Ruth chapter number two. And I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know who's going to prevail this morning. The preacher or the teacher. All right? So uh, we, the book of Ruth, the book of Ruth. It's just good to see everybody uh, this morning. And I pray that the blessings of the Lord are upon you. Uh, in our 11 o'clock, we're going to give the rundown, the report of what happened in AIM. Um, um, we got world champions uh, in our church. Amen. Amen. And I'm so excited about that, and uh, uh, promotions have taken place in the church, and we're just grateful to God. If you have Ruth, chapter number two, some of y'all struggling to find Ruth, I still hear you. Joshua judges Ruth. That's, good, that's, a, good way, that's a good way to learn. Joshua judges Ruth. Ruth is right before uh, First Samuel. Mm -hmm. Amen. So get out the, get out the New Testament. Go to the old, and uh, if you get past Joshua, as Joshua comes after the, for the Pentateuch, uh, Genesis through Deuteronomy, right? Then Joshua, Judges, Ruth. All right? Amen. Learn your books. So that's one of the challenges with being able to, you know, have everything uh, on, the, on the computer and stuff, and on your little iPhone, you don't learn, you don't learn your books and it, it works for you until your internet go down. I was, uh, I was at a grocery store one day and uh, the person had to, something happened and the cash register stopped and the person had to count the change back to me. He couldn't do it. And it got to the point where they, it was almost, whatever you say, we owe you. I started, I started to leave there rich. You know, so you want you want to. It's, it's so important that you uh, own your own Bibles. Amen. And uh, preachers, when we preach here, you can bring the computer, you can bring whatever study notes you need, but they have to be accompanied by the Bible. Amen. Amen. Now I've said that enough, so well, I don't want anybody to make a mistake. Because if you come and say, "Well, I just have mine on." Uh, this is for in-house. Now, I would guess I don't, I don't apply this pressure, uh, this standard. But if you, you're in the house and you, you know, the dog ate your Bible, you better not preach that Sunday. Because if you come up here with no Bible, we're just going to, Wilson, just take them down. Yes, sir. And that bad white suit and all, we just, <laughs> we just, just take them down. Amen. Amen. He's a bad man, isn't he? 
God is good. Ruth chapter number two. <clears throat> and I'm going to read, um, we're going to study the scripture, but I want to read in your hearing. Um, beginning at verse number 14 and read through 17 of Ruth chapter number 2. And Boaz said unto her, At mealtime, well, before I get 14, let me read verse 9, and then we'll go to 14, so that my um, subject will include certain portions of the text. Verse 9 said, and, 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 uh, it says, let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? This is Boaz talking. And when thou art Thirst, go unto the vessels and drink of the water which the young men have drawn. Verse 14. And Boaz said unto her, At mealtime, come thou here. King James says, hither. And eat the bread. Eat of the bread, that is, eat of the food, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he, Boaz, reached, look at this, her parched corn, and she did eat, Boaz served her himself and she did eat he served her he didn't serve everybody at the table he served her and she did eat and was sufficed she got full and left that is she had food left over and when she was raised up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not. Verse 16, and let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her and leave them that she may glean, that she may gather them and rebuke her not. So she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out that she had gleaned. And it was about an ephah of barley. That is, she gleaned enough food to feed two women on her first day out there for a whole week. And that doesn't happen for an inexperienced gleaner. Amen. Verse 17, so she gleaned in the field, 16 and 17, and let fall some of the handfuls of purpose for her and leave them 
that she may glean them and rebuke her not. I want to preach from this subject, and you're going to have to listen to me to get it. And you, you are accustomed to it. Visitors, you all, give me, a, give me a chance. Before you get up and walk out, you know, people are so quick to grab their purse, you know. So easily offended. I don't get that. You can sit through a movie and not like the first hour and a half, and you're still sitting there eating popcorn, <laughs> trying to wait for it to get good. <laughs> I want to preach from this subject. Affirmative action. And I'm adding to it, he's water when I'm thirsty. Bread when I'm hungry. Protection from danger and favor. Isn't that some subject? I don't blame you for sitting there looking at me. Because you don't know what, what in the world is he getting ready to talk about. Now, I got you today, didn't I? You you wouldn't know how to interpret this one. Say, so where is he headed? Uh, did he bump his head while he was uh, in Indianapolis? No, I actually bumped my head before I went. But this is not the result of your head being bumped. Affirmative action, or should I say, divine affirmative action? Maybe let me jazz it up for you a little bit. Water when I'm thirsty, bread when I'm hungry, protection from danger, and promotion. God is going to be for you water when you're thirsty, bread when you're hungry. It's going to protect you from danger. I want to prophesy favor, promotion. And God's going to do it. See, we're trying to make government God. That's the problem. Ain't nobody God but the God of the Bible. We used to believe that. We got tricked. We got tricked away from trusting God to trusting the federal government. If the government don't do it, it can't be done. Oh, I've, I've had to gently correct uh, some preachers just this week. Preachers standing up and declaring affirmative action now is gone. And uh, whether you think it should be gone or not, that's a different uh, conversation and you're open to your opinions, just like I have mine on it. But that is not what the Supreme Court did. The Supreme Court did not eliminate Affirmative action. Affirm the, the Supreme Court eliminated race uh, preferences based on race, which is affirmative action, when it comes to college admissions. Um, um, a recent uh, poll was taken so that so many of you all won't be mad with me that the overwhelming number uh, of African Americans actually agree with the ruling of the court. I know why you're not saying amen, because you watch MSNBC all day. Sit there and watch Joy Reid and she mess your head up. She got the devil in her. She needs to be needs to be needs to be delivered. See, you can't you can't trust them. You can't trust any of them now. You just can't trust any of them. When I told you all last week, I was watching a publication. I was watching Fox. It says now that affirmative action has been uh, done away with, and I said to my wife, I said, did you, did you hear that? I said, that's not true. That's not what happened. And I think that um, the media has a vested interest in keeping people divided and fighting. Um, uh, we're going into a political season, and um, everybody's gunning for your votes, so they're gonna all make you think that they're for you. You have to be educated, and you have to pay attention you have to go beyond what's there. See, some of you all uh, 
uh, I want my apology. Some of you, you sided with the CDC against the B-I-B-L-E and against me. Now, that same CDC has just now released uh, its uh, uh, guidelines. On trans women breastfeeding. Now, a trans woman is a man. A man can't breastfeed. And yet, the trusted CDC, you trusted them over me. I've been your pastor for 30, I had been your pastor 35 years, 36 years. Some of you, you posted things, you said things. I'm waiting on my apology. I would feel better. Because you, t- you trusted them over the word, of God. the word of God. Now they're really showing you, all the proof is coming out now, that uh, uh, they were suppressing any condescending thought. All of us knew if you say too much, you're going to get deplatformed. And my belief is this. If a thing is true and you know that it's true, what do you care about misinformation or anything else? The truth stands on its own. Oh, oh, we can't have misinformation. Since when? Since when? Do you think you getting information on that cocaine they found, uh, that powder they found in the White House? Now I've been to the West Wing. There are no areas in the West Wing where people can come in and go out free. There's no area. To get in the White House, uh, you got to have clearance, uh, they got to know your background, yes, your name, rank, serial number, social security. Everything. You got to pass all of that before you get in the door. And then go, going in the door, they got the best detectors, metal and otherwise. If you got something on it, the dog's going to get you. You're going into the White House. The president's in there, the vice president, all you're not going to go in there with no uh, cocaine un- unless you're in a position where, you know, you ain't subject to the rules of being examined. Somebody brought it in there. But do you think they're going to tell you what happened? And now the CDC is talking about men breastfeeding. And, uh, and they expect to still have credibility. I want to say to you always in every situation in every way side with God. Always. When the science contradicts the Bible and true science doesn't. Junk science does. But when science contradicts the Bible, side with the Bible. Amen. Okay, who it is? Side with God and you'll be blessed. Let me preach this today. The book of Ruth is an interesting book. And it's a book that uh, I I just love um, uh, for its context as much as its content. It is contextually uh, so relevant to the times in which we live. I said to the guys today in the back before we came out, I picked up my Bible and I said, this is the oldest new book you've ever seen. This is an old book, but it is so new that the future hadn't caught up with it yet. You know, they're talking about all this artificial intelligence and all that. It's been in the Bible ever since the Bible has been written, talking about the beast. And his image. The image is not a person. Mm -mm. All this technology is catching up to the Bible. The things that John saw that he wrote about in the book of Revelation. The challenge of John's writings is that you had a first century man who wrote in a day where the top technology was a, wasn't even a horse and buggy. 
And he had to write about the things that he saw in 2023 and beyond. So he described it as he saw it. And God gave him a mammoth task. He said to John, the things that you see, write. And he didn't even explain to him what he saw. Because it wasn't for him to understand. It was for him to write it. You see. And so as we read the writings of this first century man. As he wrote about 2023 20, and beyond. We have to, we see why over the years the interpretation of what was written changed because technology and culture had to catch up with this powerful book, the book of Revelation, which is called the history of the future. The book of Ruth, both in content and context, is now. It is relevant. It is what we see today. Why is it that way, uh, preacher? The Bible says in chapter 1, verse 1, Now it came to pass in the days of... When the judges ruled. That's an interesting uh, footnote right there. We could preach from this. And Dr. Foster, you know what I'm talking about. For the rest of the day. The judges were, the judges functioned as basically military leaders. In times of crisis. And they also served as local rulers administering political and legal justice and the time of the judges was a time mixed with lawlessness and chaos. For the Bible says this about those days and it's, it says this repeatedly in the book of Judges and um, um, so you have to look all of the, the occurrences up. Judges chapter 21 and 25 says, in those days there was no king in Israel. And here's, the, here's what you got to know. And every man had his own truth. Just like today. The text says every man did that which was right. In his own eyes. In his own sight. Every man. So, we, so when, you, you, when you hear this stuff about your truth and my truth, and I'm going to stick to uh, uh, my truth and you ought to stick to your truth, that's not new. It was wrong. It's wrong now. It was wrong then. It leads to chaos. It, that kind of talk will destroy a community, destroy a church, and destroy a nation. Because it gives the idea that there's no such thing as overarching truth. That right and wrong are man-made constructs and concepts and nothing is wrong in and of itself. It's only wrong if you think it's wrong. That's a lie. It's only right if you think it's right. No, that's a lie. There are things that are right and there are things that are wrong. And this is why you need the Holy Ghost. And you need a good church. And you need a preacher who will stand up and tell you what I'm telling you right now. So that you will develop discernment. And you need to come to church. Let me add that. So that you would develop discernment. You don't need discernment to discern the difference between what is right and what is wrong. You need discernment to discern the difference between what is right and what is almost right. See, that's where people are getting caught up and mixed up and thrown off on the almost are you listening to me? There was no king. David, the mighty king David, had not arrived yet. The great Elijahs and Elishas and Samuels had not been born yet. And the mighty Moses and Joshua was dead and gone. 
between this time called the dark days of Israel. Now when I speak of Israel, I'm not speaking of the northern kingdom nor the southern kingdom because Israel was one at this time. The nation was a nation given to chaos because everybody did what they wanted to do. And when people are left to their own devices like that, people do dumb things. They do silly things. And um, let me say this to the men today. Brethren, especially men who are married, you have an august responsibility. You need to know God. You need to know how to hear God. You need to know how to follow God. I was talking to an attorney not too long ago and she was sharing with me just the sheer number of women who are locked up in prisons. And she said the overwhelming majority of women who are locked up in prison, they got in prison, they got locked up following the dictates of some man. He led her into a life of crime. He got her to do what she did. She did it listening to him. And you don't need to marry nobody who can't lead you. That's right. See, you, do, you, you, you messed up when, you, when you've done that. You just messed up. You, you pray that he, uh, the only solution is that he grows. But you knew he couldn't lead you spiritually when you married him. See, it's amazing how people get innocent during that time. Now, the whole, everybody told you he wasn't, you know, he wasn't ready. But it's something about those cold and lonely nights. The flesh, or the way the church mother used to say it, the flush <laughs> took over. And uh, next thing you know, you, you, here you are spiritually, you graduated from college, spiritually speaking, and you marry somebody who's spiritually in elementary school. Why are you talking about this? Because it happened in the text. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. Look at this. There was a famine in the land. What? There was a famine. And a certain man of, he gives us the where, Bethlehem, Judea. Went, he left Judea, he left Bethlehem, Bethlehem, house of bread. He left the house of bread, and he went and sojourned in the country of, of all countries, Moab. I told you the teacher wants to talk today. Moab, east of the Dead Sea. And Moab was um, fertile. That's why you got to have discernment, you got to pray. There's a famine in the house of bread, but in Moab, the land is fertile. So to the non discerning man, the dummy, it makes sense to take your family from Bethlehem, the city that would be the birthplace of Jesus, and David, the burial site of Rachel, Bethlehem, of the tribe of Judah. And go to fertile Moab. Some of you leave your good church where you're getting fed the word. And you go to Moab. And Moab, we get out earlier. In Moab, they don't preach against homosexuality. 
lesbianism. We ain't going to talk about tattoos. We ain't going to talk about any of that stuff. We're just going to have a good time. Moab. Moab. And, and, and the thing about it is, Moab is a nation of ancestral roots. If you remember in Genesis chapter 19, Lot's daughters got him drunk and had sex with him and got pregnant for their daughter, their daddy and gave birth to two nations, Ammon and Moab. That's the historicity of the city. The Moabites were known for being fierce, arrogant, given to idolatry, and their women were known for being quite deceptive. Moab, a country known for its resistance of Israel when they came out of Egypt. All Israel wanted was clear passage. The Moabites fought them. Moab. It was Moab. It was, it was the women of Moab that caused the plague to break out in Israel that killed 24,000 in one day. The text teaches in, in Numbers 25 that it was the Moabite women who enticed the men of Israel to marry them. See, the Moabite women, uh, brethren, they were looking good. They were looking good. And um, the Israeli women at the time were not, they, was, they were not at their best because they, they been, they, they're, they're nomads. You, they're in the wilderness. They're traveling. They're dusty. They're going from here, there. They've been wandering the wilderness 40 years. Going through all kinds of changes. But the Moabite women, they're fresh. Dressed up. They're not weather beaten. See, all of us, you know, time takes a toll on all. All of us, you know, uh, as as time go by, it takes longer to get ready. <laughs> See, when you were young and spry, you just jump up and throw on something, and that would work. But as the years roll on, you don't just comb your hair; you fix your hair. <laughs> Time and weather takes its toll. Oh my! If the skin ain't as clear, put something on it. But it takes time, and you know. And I'm not against that. I think it's wise to realize that you're not 12 anymore, and so you you invest more time now than you did when you didn't have to. People put on things that they didn't have to wear years ago. <laughs> Hold this in and pull that in. Tuck this. Time. More bite. <laughs> I told you I wanted to teach you a little bit this morning. And so the, those women enticed those uh, Hebrew men and the men began to serve uh, those women and, and they began to serve their God. Molech was one of the gods of the Moabite. And Chemosh was one of their gods. And babies were burned and sacrificed to their gods. And these deceitful women um, gave Israel a hard time. Which shows you that this man was not following God. 
He did not respond properly to his crisis when he went to Moab. Doesn't matter whether there's a famine in Israel or not, you don't go to Moab. He packed up his family. Ladies, he packed up his family. I don't care what he said. I'm, no, if he ain't spiritual, you got to go with him. Well, well you know, uh, he says that the Lord is leading him to join the mosque. I don't believe it's the Lord, but you know, I'm just so tired of fighting. We know it's just going to be a matter of time before you go anyway. That's why you have to, you have to pay attention. Right. Pay attention. Pay attention. Don't run down the aisle too fast. Amen. Don't, don't sit around and count who's left. She's buried. There. And it seems like to me, Lord, I'm being overlooked. Your worst day alone. It's better than your best day with the wrong man. I'm not going to charge you for that. That's good preaching. Let's go home, man. <laughs> Let's end the 8 o'clock service. That's good enough. I gave you some good advice. Now some of y'all ain't saying amen because you're a bad man. You ain't a good husband. Grow up. Become a good one. Come on to Bible study. Learn. Become a spiritual leader. Why she got to encourage you? Wow. I'd be insulted for Pam to encourage me to attend church. Uh -huh. Hey, I am a man. Right. Amen. Amen. When she wake up, I'm gone. Right. I kiss her on the way up to baby, I'm going down. <laughs> I, got, I, got to, I got to go to church. It's in me. She's coming, but you know, I mean, she ain't got the stamina that I have. I'm the man. No man, your wife got more stamina than you. Something's wrong. That's right. Man up. All right, all right, we're good. Make sure you're still there. You know I'm the National Men's Ministry Director. Sir, with Bishop Golden, and we're having a marvelous time. Look at what he did. The Bible says he went to Moab. He and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife, Naomi, and his two sons, Melon and Chilion. Euphratites, another word for Bethlehem of Judea. And they came to the country of Moab. They went to the enemy of Israel and continued there and while living there we're not told how long they were there but after they were established there tragedy struck the man who led them away from the house of bread who put them in that bad situation. Y'all not to bring drugs to your house. Y'all not to bring liquor to your house. Y'all not to bring pornography to your house. You know, y'all not to bring these things, gambling to your house, man. The man who brought these things, brought them to that place, he died. Now they're established in Moab. And, you know, people say, why don't you just leave? Well, you can't just leave. You got roots. You, 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 your life is there now. He died. And then uh, something happened. And between verse 3 and 4, years pass because the boys get grown. They grow up. All right? So uh, the average Israeli young man, Hebrew young man, got married between the ages of 18 and 20. You go past 20 in the Hebrew culture, in the biblical term, times, and you hadn't had a wife, they assumed you were cursed of God. Today, men, most men wait to their 30s and 40s. 
What's that all about? And if you're in church, I don't, I don't know what you're waiting on. Because you ain't living holy. Because you, you ain't walking on water. You, you're not raising the dead. None of the signs of being that consecrated accompany your life. See, a, a consecrated person can do extraordinary things. So, oh yes, I've been just walking right for the last, I'm 40 years, I've been saved for 20. I ain't touched no woman, no kind of way, that whole time the Lord is keeping me. And you ain't in her, you, and, and you're not trying to find a wife. Uh, come on, man. What do, what do I look like? Well, you don't know. Yes, I do. I was a young man single in the church. And I had the Holy Ghost. I found out that I needed more than him. <laughs> y'all don't like my preaching it. I know you wish I was still in Indianapolis, Indiana. So uh, the boys grew up. And the Bible says they did something that was unthinkable. It was unthinkable for a Hebrew to marry a Moabite. Because Moab was their enemy. Their gods were not the god of the Hebrews. So that gives you an idea how the culture affected this family. They got so uh, immersed in the Moabite lifestyle that it is casually mentioned that these men married two Moabite women. Are you with me? They married, verse 4, men, women of Moab. One's name was Oprah and the other, Ruth. Amen. And the Bible, history says this about Ruth, not the Bible, history. Ladies, the Bible says, history teaches a tradition that Ruth was the prettiest woman that you never seen. She was known for her extraordinary beauty. So you, you understand why one of the brothers went on and made that leap. And he married her. She was beautiful. And, um, but notice this. They got married and they lived a married life and dwelt there for 10 more years. Then tragedy struck again. God was telling them something. Both of her sons-in-law died. Her husband is dead. She's been a widow now for 10 years. Her sons got married. But both of her sons died. I said sons-in-law. Both of her sons died. Now she's left there with two daughters-in-law. And at this time, Naomi is a minority. She's a Hebrew living in Moab. She's the minority. All right? And... Uh, she decides, I'm going back home. Because, how about this? The word came that there was bread in the house of bread. That God had moved and, oh, the economy had exploded. And they were blessed in Bethlehem, Judea, which says they should have waited. Perhaps her husband would have, would have still been alive. Perhaps her sons would have been alive. Perhaps they would have married uh, Hebrew women. She decides that she's going back home. And she tells both of her daughters-in-law, says, I'm going, I'm going home. You go back to your people. And I bid you Godspeed that you find husbands. 
All right? And they said, no, we, we want to hang with you. She said, why? Say, even if I had uh, boys in my womb, which I'm past that now. I doubt that I ever, ever even marry again. Could you hang around until those, I gave birth and then the boys grew up and they were, became men where they could marry it? We're talking about uh, another uh, 18 years. And by that time, if you're going to wait 18 years, how do you know they're going to want you? And ain't nobody your age going to hardly want you. So you need to go home. Oprah kissed her and said, you're right. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, she did. And Oprah said, I'm going home. And, uh, and she went home. Ruth was different. Ruth said to her, I'm not going to leave you. As a matter of fact, I'm committed to you. Now, you, you can't mistreat Oprah for what she did. She didn't do wrong. But, because she did what she was asked to do, what she was told to do, what common sense said. But Ruth was different. Ruth was committed to her, listen to this, broke, widowed mother-in-law who owned no property. It's because people, people be committed to people who got money. So, so had she been an old rich woman, oh, yes, mother. <laughs> mother, I'll be right there with you every step of the way, hoping you're in the wheel. Naomi had no wheel. Naomi had no money. Naomi had nothing. And yet Ruth was committed to her. To the point that Ruth said, I'm changing my religion. My God will become, be your God. And if you go home, I'll learn. I'll become a proselyte. I'll become a citizen. I'll shift from majority status to minority status. For your people shall become my people. Your God will be my God. Where you go, I'll go. And wherever you die and you are buried, I will die there and be buried. And the text teaches that uh, verse 18 of chapter 1, I'm, I'm, I'm spending too much time here. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left off speaking to her. Naomi got upset. Naomi said to Ruth, you're hard-headed. You need to go home. I ain't got nothing for you. Ruth said, I ain't going nowhere. Naomi started walking. She looked back. Ruth walking right behind her. Naomi stopped. Ruth stopped. Naomi stopped back walking. Ruth stopped back walking. You need to go home. I ain't going nowhere. I'm going wherever you go. And so you see two women crossing the Dead Sea, going west, going back to Bethlehem of Judea. When Naomi arrived, the people were glad to see her. But Naomi said, uh, don't celebrate my return. Matter of fact, don't even call me Naomi. Call me Myra. I'm bitter. Verse 21, she says, for I went out full. Uh, brethren, following her husband. Following her husband. I'm not getting an amen. I went out full and I came back empty. But you know, God's got something for a roof because a roof going to show up empty but leave full. God knows how. God has an action. God knows how to affirm you. And he'll reward faithfulness. See, some of you are only faithful to people who can do things for you. I've, wa I've watched that. And I, I see that amongst... Uh, people of every age, and I, I really see this trend among our younger members. You work with who you feel can do something for you. People to whom you think have nothing for you, you have nothing for them. And 
As long as a person is doing for you, you like them, but you don't return anything. You'll never be a Ruth. See how quiet y'all got then? I'm your shepherd. I'm telling you something. You ought to let God deliver you while there's time. You're not, people are not extras in your life. You're not the star. You're one of, a, of, of the rest. And love people. Uh, be a servant of people. See. I want, I, want you, I want you to do something. I want you to participate in this thing that's helping me. But some of you never do things to help other people. Don't even show up. You put on something, you're trying to get others to come and help, help out. You help somebody that threw a, a, a gathering and had helped someone who you knew couldn't help you. Then you called on people to help, and they wouldn't do it. What's in it for me? I got to look out for number one. You'll never be Ruth. Because once you develop that mentality, guess who stops looking out for you? God. So if you're going to look out for number one, then why should God look out for number one? Since you, since you have taken his job. If I heard him say, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So now if you're going to do God's job, then God ain't going to do his job. Y'all don't like me today. Yeah. So Naomi shows up broke, busted, disgusted, and by the way, with a person from a enemy race with her, a stone minority. In fact, Ruth was such a minority. Woo! Such a unliked woman that even in the book of Ruth, Ruth is referred to at least five times in the book of Ruth as Ruth the Mobitus. The writer wanted you to know that she was not Hebrew, which meant that she was viewed by the people with suspicion, distrust, and dislike. She was the N-word before, before it was invented. So here's a little darky. Yes. Naomi shows up with a woman of the enemy race. We know she ain't no good. For her ancestry is, is rooted in uh, incest. You come from a people whose daughter screwed the daddy. You come from a people who were constant. They constantly harassed us when we came out of Egypt. You come from a people whose gods are wicked gods. You come from a people whose culture is immoral. We don't trust you. You're not one of us. You are a Mobitus. 1 and 22, 2 and 2, 2, 21, 4 and 5, and verse 10. Five times she's called the Mobitus. So you'll know how life was for her. But this Mobitus, I like her. Uh, she had... Some things going for her beyond her beautiful looks. Listen to this, millennials. She had a work ethic. This is y'all not y'all not getting anything out of this. Today. But let me try. Let me try. They returned, according to verse twenty-two, at the time of the beginning of the harvest. Chapter 2 gives us some more context within the content. And Naomi had a kinsman, 
of her husband, a, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Imelech, and his name was Boaz. Seemed to me he would have stayed with him instead of going down to Moab. But you know how it is. Everybody's got to charter their own course. Sometimes your own family members resent you for your success. And they go do stupid things to show you, I don't need him. I don't need her. I can make it myself. Went down there and died. His sons died. No, you needed him. So your widow comes back years later, approximately 18 to 20. No, about 28 years later. Maybe 38. And Boaz is powerful. He's rich. Are you praying for me? And Ruth is mentioned in verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 22. It's mentioned again here in chapter 2, verse 2. And Ruth the Mobitus. We want you to know she's not Hebrew. This is a minority. This is a little in-girl, inward girl before the inward was formed. Good old Ruth. Y'all ain't going to forget that. I can see you going out to breakfast now. Hey, end girl, before the end girl, what a word was for. <laughs> yeah. And so, <laughs> and Ruth the Mobitus said to Naomi, see, she's different. Let me go to the field and glean. Let me gather ears of corn. Corn. Um, after him in whose sight I shall find grace. That is, let me go out. She didn't say let us. Let me go out and try to find a job. We got to eat. We got to eat. You're a widow. I'm a widow. These people aren't going to give us anything. Uh, the government ain't rushing in with cheese or anything else. If we're going to make it, somebody's got to work. And I don't expect you to go. You're much older than I am. So young folk now will stay home and let you go to work. Mom out there on the cane, where you going to work? And, and, and the kid home. Right. You raise monsters. They land on the couch. Right. You ought to take that cane on the way out the door and just bam and keep on walking. Just, just keep on. So, so what happened to her? I don't know. <laughs> she said, let me go out and get a job. And thank God, uh, Naomi Naomi said, uh, go, my daughter. <laughs> go ahead. Text says, and she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. Um, show them the slide. I want you to see it. Number one of, of Ruth gleaning. I want you all to see Ruth so I can show. Now, uh, you see, this is to glean. The word glean means to gather. Now, if you see in the upper corner, you see a man with a sickle in his hand. He represents, those men are reapers. With the sickle in your hand, you out there in the grain, and you cut the stalks, and you form bundles of stalks. That's what the reapers would do. After they cut the stalks, there was always portions of the stalks that would fall to the ground. Basically what's left over. The gleaners would gather what's left over. After the shearers cut the stalks. Does that make sense? Show them the next one. You can see it should be, you see it even better now. You see him cutting the stuff. And you see, she's picking it up off the ground. And they're working. 
So she goes out in the field and she gets a job. Ladies, she's beautiful, but she ain't too pretty to work. Look at her. Oh, those pretty little hands. Picking up that, pick up that grain, baby. You got to eat. You got, you got a choice between soft hands or empty stomach at this point, right? So she's picking it up. She's, she's picking it up. Are you with me? And the Bible teaches, are you, are you following me now? That uh, in verse 3 it says, and her hat was to light on a part of of the field belonging to Boaz. She just so happens. Because she never met him. Even though he was kin to Naomi. She never met Boaz. She just so happened as she's following God. To go to Boaz field. And to go to work. And while she's out there. In the field. Working for Boaz. And you know, God is so good. God is so good. The Bible tells us something. That the Lord made, made, made provisions for her, you know, even before she knew she would need them. The Bible says in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 9 and 10, And when, and, and when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field. Neither shall thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest. And thou shalt not glean thine vineyards, neither shalt thou gather every grape of thy vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and stranger. I am the Lord. That is, you shall have a God-ordained set aside. I'm headed somewhere. God said when you gather, even though you have the ability to gather everything, don't. Leave something for the poor. Now don't gather it for the poor. The poor got to work for themselves. They got to glean it for themselves. You got to, but, you, but I want you to leave it because you're in an advantaged position. They're in a disadvantaged position. And here it's God saying in Leviticus, I want you to leave a set aside. So that the disadvantaged will have something. So now Ruth is a minority. A widow. Connected to a mother-in-law who has nothing. And she goes out in the field and she needs to glean. She can't glean like those shearers can shear. This is her first time doing that. So she begins to pick up what God had left for her. I'm preaching better than you saying amen. And so while she's out there, I'm watching the clock. The Bible teaches that of all things, verse 4, Boaz came to the field. Here come the man. And uh, when he came to the field, he saw the gleaners, the, the reapers, the, those men with those sickles cutting. And by the way, women, the reapers was the job uh, that the men did. And the gleaning was the job that the women did. Now don't get mad and go home. Praise the Lord. The jobs were gender specific. <laughs> Man, I'm, I'm getting scared, uh, Elder Wilson. And so, uh, Boaz, notice, we, we learned something about his character. Here he is, the owner, and he says to the, to the, to the reapers, uh, a, a sanctified boss man said the Lord be with you and they answered him the Lord bless thee ain't that something now you know the average workforce don't send the blessing back to the boss they, they send the finger 
<laughs> but the, the, but the, these people said to him, the Lord blessed thee. As he said, he was a good boss. He paying him right. The Lord bless you. One of the keys to keeping good help is you got to pay him. That, that'll preach right there. And Boaz said to his servants that was set over the reapers, who is this? I told you, she was the prettiest woman that you'd never seen. There was a whole lot of women out there gathering. All of them in the field, working. But he notices one. And uh, one woman. And he want to know, who is this? We're saying, what is this? He said, who is this? Make folks say I'm acting strange. Who is this? Who is this? Woman. And the servant said, uh, the servant who was over the reapers, he says, she's a mobitish. Uh, she's an N-word before the N-word was invented. She's a mobitish. Bible called Moab a wash pot. That ain't no compliment. Praise the Lord. Would you want to be somebody's vanity? So, said, so yeah, she's the Moabitess damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. Notice the emphasis on her race and her origin. That was not meant as a compliment. That's to color her a certain way. And she said, you see, after he, after he spoke up, you can learn something from her. You can learn something from her. Uh, see, no, y'all want to, you want to get all your teachings from uh, marriage in Huntsville. Ready to love and all that. No, you, you, you look. Those people are all losers. Anytime you got to go on a reality show to get somebody to love you and get married, you, you're losing. And those shows are directed by homosexuals. So why are you on a show directed by a homosexual dealing with marriages? No wonder all the marriages are so much drama. A homosexual is directing it. He don't want the marriage to work and uh, teach the women that all this smart talk or loud mouth. Uh, uh, look, that ain't, they ain't attracted to no man. Oh, you, you always got a word. You always, the brothers are clapping their hand now. You always got, you, you always got something to say. You always, no, 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 man, no, man don't like that. Now nah, he don't expect you to be mute, but, but let him finish his sentence. He inhaled to say something. There you go. She spoke up. And she said, notice, polite from the start. I pray you, let me glean. Please don't fire me. Let me do this and gather after the reapers among the sheaves, among the stalks of grain that the reapers cut and they tie them together and into sheaves and there's some leftover on the ground would you please, sir, let me, I pray you, not I demand, not you better, not you are a Hebrew, whatever. She said, I pray you, let me do this job. Because she needed the job. It's amazing to me how you need the job, but you're telling the boss, oh, but you need the job. <laughs> so you walk out, you don't have the job, but I guess, I guess you can spend, I told them all. See how much bread that's going to buy. See how much gas that's going to buy. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I told them. Gas, $5 a gallon. Now you stand there praying, speaking in tongues, praying that, oh, God, let this credit card work just one more time. Trying to put the thing in, hoping because you ain't got no money. When had you just been like Ruth? I'm not getting any amens now. So I'm not getting any help. You, the situation could have been better. See, we learn from the hip hop and all this. 
bad. You know, all this, this attitude stuff. This attitude is going to get you nowhere. It's going to keep you on the bottom. Now, there's times when you have to be assertive. There are times where it's necessary to be indignant. That, that lady told the unjust judge, look, if you don't get up and give me some justice, I'm going to hit you in the eye. But she eventually got there. You don't start there. You don't like it, do you? I have a job. I'm trying to tell you something. See, let me try to tell people. They won't listen to you. Listen to the Bible. She said, let me do this. So she came. And I have continued. Look at this. So she came and continued even from the morning until now. He let her stay and she worked up until lunchtime. At lunchtime, they took a break. At lunchtime. They had the five breaks they take now before lunch. They took a break at lunchtime. I'm preaching good. And she tarried a little in the house. They went to the big house. And they're on the lunch break. And then said, Boaz unto Ruth, hearest thou not? Now, y'all need to know there are other women who are gleaners. There are other women who are gleaners. There are other women who are gleaners. But Boaz keeps talking to Ruth. What's that all about? Seems to be a little smitten, brother, right? To me, with this Moabite. Mobitish woman. And so he says to her, uh, go not to glean in another field. Don't go nowhere else. Oh, you say what you want to. Something's going on. Something's going on. Don't, uh, honey, don't you? Stay right there. Keep on working in this field. Now, he's a rich man. Text already tells us that. He don't need her to glean anything for him. He wants to bless her. But notice, blessing wasn't giving her anything but a job. I can't get no help from you all. And I've tried. <laughs> Y'all won't help me. So he says to her, keep working. Don't go to another field. Neither go from hence. Abide here fast. I told you other women were working. By my maidens. Are you with me? Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap. And go thou after them. Look, wherever they go. My maidens, that's where you go. And he says this. Look at this. Protection from danger. I have. I. Look at this. Have I not charged the young men. That they shall not touch thee. I have told every one of those men. Don't you bother her. She's off limits. Do her no harm, number one. Also, do not be rude to her. She's a, she's, a, she's a minority. Do not be rude to her. Also, do not play any tricks on her. You know, there's a lot of tricks, a lot of games that people play. Out there in the field, there's a whole lot of tricks they could pull on her to hurt her productivity, to hurt her. Says, and no insensitivity. No games. Leave her alone. And let her work. So all, all of them know now. She's off limits. This is. Now this was not from government. This was from private industry. Y'all not saying amen. God moved on Boaz. To him leave her alone. And let her work. Don't gather it for her. I don't need you to do that. She'll work. She's got the character. She'll get it done. But don't work against her. 
So I don't look at God protecting her from danger. And when thou art thirsty, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Not only is he protection from danger, but he's water when she's thirsty. What's not understood about this is that that was not allowed. The gleaners, the ladies who gleaned, were not allowed to go and drink the water that the shearers had put in water jars, that the men had put in jars for themselves. They were doing the lion's share of the physical work. The ladies who came behind to pick up the scraps were not allowed to go and drink their water. And yet God moves on boys. And says, Ruth, when you get thirsty, go on and drink that water. And I've told every one of them, don't bother her. Don't say anything to her. If you see her over there by the water jar, you better not say, what are you doing? You're out of place. Who do you think you are? I'm Ruth. And he told me, I could drink as much water uh, as I want, and you can't bother me. It's just like God. God knows how to protect you. Well, Pastor, he's not protecting me. Yes, he is. You had not watched the news lately? You don't see all the people who are getting shot and killed, folk dying on the highway, houses burning down, all kinds of things, planes f- are falling from the sky, danger here, danger there, gunshots here, gunshots there, and look at you, you're protected. Your children are watched over. That's the goodness of the law. There ain't nobody in here thirsty. For God will provide. Won't he do it? So now she's given protection. And she's given water. Can I get a witness? And the young men know you better not touch her. Then notice her. Notice her response to his kindness. Then she fell on her face. She didn't receive it with a spirit of entitlement. She fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have you been so good to me? How did I find grace? How did I get into your good grace like that? Because you're already rich. You already have employees. You were doing good before I came along. You don't need me to live. I need you. I need a job. So you don't need me. Why are you being so good to me? Oh my. Why would you show me this kind of. Why would you even take knowledge of me. She says. Seeing I am a minority. I'm a stranger. It is mentioned in the Bible at least 100 times. How we are to treat strangers. It's mentioned in the Bible at least 100 times. How we are to treat the poor. When you're good to the poor. He that giveth to the poor lendeth to the Lord. And uh, 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 I am for legal immigration. But whether a person is here legally or illegally. When you come face to face with a stranger. You got to be a Christian. And you got to treat people a certain kind of way. Now don't get me wrong. I'm for, if I had my way, the wall would have been built twice. But there's a difference between protecting your border and recognizing that you're dealing with somebody whom God made. And the Bible teaches that we're to be kind to the stranger. You want God's favor? Be kind to someone who can't be kind to you. You want God's favor? Do something for someone who can't do anything for you. Y'all hear me? You hear me pulling the train. Praise the Lord. I'm trying to pick up so you can go home. Amen. Because the way this sermon is going, I'm going to preach all the way to 11 (laughs) o'clock. So, praise the Lord. (laughs) So, look at this thing here. And Boaz answered her. Now, now, doctor, you know this. And uh, some of you who are Bible students, you know this. 
The rest of you, you're going to learn today. The Bible says in verse 11, and Boaz answered. The word answered there. If you study answered there, it doesn't mean that he merely responded, but it literally means he raised his voice. He talked loud enough for everybody to hear his answer. For he wanted them to know why he was giving this woman preferential treatment. Why he had put in place this affirmative action. He said, he answered and said, it hath been fully showed me. Mm -hmm. All that thou hast done, verse 11, uh, to thy mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how that thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity and art come to a people which thou knowest not. Heretofore the Lord recompense thy work you see, saints, it's always right to do right. Sometimes when you're doing right, it seems as though you're being had. Sometimes when you're doing right, it seems like you're getting the short end of the stick. Oh, Lord. We don't know what happened to Oprah, but we know what happened to Ruth. And uh, the word reached Boaz. And Boaz said, I heard about how you took care of, praise the Lord, my kinsman's widow. And the Lord recompense thy work. And a full reward be given thee of the Lord, God of Israel. Notice Boaz didn't say he was being good to her. He was saying God is blessing you. I wonder do anybody here have a praise for the Lord? He said, uh, look at this. It's the reward given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings thou art come to trust. You see, she traded Chemosh for God. She traded Molech for God and said, since you began to trust in Yahweh, Yahweh is, is blessing you. And then she said, let me find favor in thy sight. My Lord, for thou hast uh, comforted me. And for that, thou hast spoken friendly unto thy handmaid. She said, you've been kind to me, though I be not like unto thine own handmaids. In other words, she said, even though I'm not a Hebrew like the rest of the women, you've been kind to me. And look at what happened here. Notice that Boaz, he's still talking to her. Boaz shows increased interest in this woman. Praise the Lord at the noon meal. The Bible says, and Boaz said unto her, Meet time, come thou here and eat of the bread. This shows you here, God being bread when she's hungry. I've showed you water when she's thirsty. I've showed you protection from danger. And now he is being bread when she's hungry. He said, come here and eat. Good God Almighty. Eat the bread and don't, don't, don't just eat it, but I want you to enjoy the food. Go on and dip it in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers. Uh, see, it's meal time again. And she sat beside the reapers and uh, began to eat. And notice this, when she sat there, all the other women was there. But notice this. I like this. I think it's mighty romantic. I love a good uh, romance story. The Bible says, see, Boaz, ain't no need you hating the, uh, the player. Boaz was the man. Boaz, the Bible says, and he reached her parched corn and she did eat. 
other words, he began to serve her. All the mother Hebrew women sitting there looking at her funny. All the rest of them sitting there having to get their own food. But Boaz said, let me feed you. And she sat there with a fine set and let him feed her real good. And the Bible says she ate until she got full. But look at her. She's always thinking about Naomi. When she got full, she didn't throw it away. But she took what she had left and wrapped it up and saved it for later. Look at God. He did for her what Jesus did when he fed the 5,000. That was something left over. How many know that we serve the God who is more than enough? He knows how to bless you. He knows how to deliver. And look at the text. It says here, and when she was risen up uh, to glean, notice this, after all of these blessings, I love this girl, she decided I'm going back to work. I got to go back to the field. And she didn't even complain about it. She stood up with a fine set, full with her extra food. And she stood up. And when she stood up, something stood up in Boaz. And Boaz commanded the young men, saying, Notice this now, saints. Let her, let her glean even among the sheaves. Look at this promotion. She's been gleaning, picking up what was left on the ground. But I'm getting ready to promote her. I don't want her to glean from the ground. But I want her to glean from the sheaves. Glean from the stalks. She ain't got to bend over as much. Take some of the stalks, the bunches. You know the church of God in Christ seal with the grain. Get the stalks and give them to her. And when she get them from the stalks, don't reproach her. Don't accuse her of being out of place. Don't bother her. And not only that, let fall also of the handfuls of purpose that is take stalks from the bundles and lay them out there where she can easily gather them here's the affirmative action and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not so she gleaned she gathered and it was much easier for her and when she got through she had a bumper crop why because the lord had given her promotion there's the favor the lord had given her bread when she was hungry water when she was thirsty protection from danger the lord gave her set aside the lord gave her affirmative action to help her out she had the work but god made the provision and she went to work and the lord made a way and i'm here to tell you you don't have to depend on government you don't have to depend on who's in the white house but if you put your trust in the lord if you live right if you pray right if you help somebody who can't help you the bible is right be not deceived God is not mocked whatsoever. A man sow that shall he also reap. If you help somebody, God will help you. If you remember someone, the Lord will bless you. If you stop being selfish and let God have his way, he will make a way for you. He will give you favor. He will open doors say yeah say yeah yeah everybody who wants
wants to lodge affirmative action, meet me on the altar. God knows how to give you favor. God knows how to provide. God knows how to do what you need done. Oh, Lord. Ooh, Jesus. Won't he do it? We serve the God who makes the crooked way straight, the rough way smooth. He exalts every valley and brings down every mountain. Any way you look at it, smooth selling. Any way you look at it. He just smoothed everything out, made it much easier. Oh, if we could just get on a street and just ride on a street, everything's much easier. You can glide. Hallelujah. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Father, our time is up today, but you gave me this word for the people of God. For the people of God. And God, even though the character, the person in the book is a lady, this also deals with all of us every man here every woman here God we need your favor Lord we need your protection Lord we need your water God we need your abundance Lord we need your bread in the name of Jesus and God with all the times being as they are now we can't trust the government we can't trust the media but I found out that we can still trust you because you are the Lord and there's nobody like you. There's nobody like you, oh God. In the name of Jesus and Father right now, I pray favor, that Ruth-like favor on every believer. I pray, oh God, that you would give them favor in the eyes of Boaz. In the name of Jesus, I pray, oh God, that you would open doors in the name of Jesus. I pray, oh God, that you would heal, heal bodies in the name of Jesus. Deliver, deliver right now. And obstacles that are in the way, God, move them. Move every obstacle, move every obstacle, move every obstacle. Now give us the patience to wait. Give us the patience to keep a Ruth-like attitude. Give us a patience. Give us the patience and the self-control not to go off the deep end in the name of Jesus. Give us the trust not to look out for ourselves, but to trust you to do it and to follow your lead in this waltz. God, we have to follow your lead. Hallelujah. God's the lead dancer. If you follow his lead, it'll come out right. The anointing be upon you. God's favor be upon you. God's glory be upon you. And God give you favor. God give you peace. God gives you prosperity in the name of Jesus. And as the Lord blesses you, you tell everybody that God did it. That God did it. That God did it. The God of the Bible, he opened this door. He made it possible. He saved my children. He gave me this job. He increased my income. He blessed my flow. He opened the doors. Yes, he did. I'm sitting in an office that I didn't have the qualifications for. I'm drinking from a well that I didn't dig. I'm eating from a vineyard that I didn't plant. I'm living in a house house that I didn't build the Lord ah, the Lord the Lord made a way God did it and I want to give him praise I want to give him glory I want you right now to thank God for his divine affirmative action thank God that the Lord's favor is upon you that the Lord will give you preferential treatment I know that with God there's no respect of persons but I found out that God's favor is among them who honors him for the Bible said him that honor me I will honor 
and him that dishonor me, I will despise. Oh, honor the Lord, live for him, walk upright, trust him, wait on him, and he will. Oh, he will. He'll bless you. He'll open doors. He'll make a way. Keep your hand in the Lord's hand. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Now praise him right where you are. Praise him like you believe. It's already done because it is. It's already done. It's already done. Favor, water, bread, protection, kindness. Ah! Oh Lord, oh Lord, won't He do it? Uh, our time is up. You go, go, go to your seat. Praising God, we got to stop. We got to stop. I've learned how to lean and depend on Jesus. He's in my strength. Oh, Lord. And he's my guide. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You know, the text says, Chapter 4, verse 10. She was called Ruth the Mobitus for the last time. Because in chapter 4, verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. She became his wife. And you know, uh, she gave birth to Obed. Obed gave birth to Jesse. And Jesse gave birth to Jesus, to David. And then if you go to Matthew chapter 4, chapter 1 and verse 4, it teaches, And Salmon begat Boaz of Rachel, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth. Ruth gave birth to Obed. And Obed begat Jesse. That's verse 5. Now, I'm reading now in the family line of Jesus Christ. And in verse 16 of Matthew 1, And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. This Mobitus woman ended up in the family line of Jesus Christ. I found out if I trust him, he will provide. Lift your hand, let's receive this offering. Father, in Jesus' name, we receive our gifts. We bring our tithe and we give them to you right now. And God put favor, special favor, Ruth like favor. On every time and every offering. In Jesus' name. Amen. I've learned how to lean and depend on Jesus. Mm -hmm. He's my friend, oh Lord, and He's my God. Learn how to lean and depend on Jesus alone. I found out if I trust Him, He will provide. Singing, oh, what a fellowship! Oh, what a joy divine! Leaning on. Oh, what a blessedness, what 
peace is mine Leaning on his arms I've learned how to lean And depend on Jesus He is my, he's my friend And he's my God I've learned how to lean He's so good to me And depend In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everybody standing. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. You tell them when they're coming in and you're on your way out. Said, Pastor preached about affirmative action today. But don't think you know what he's going to say. And don't tell him anything. Don't you try to preach it. Everybody shout, God first.